video Welcome will be shared everybody afterwards. to Energy Security and Green Infrastructure Week and the webinar on uh, organized by ADBA on the role of small on-farm AD in a renewable energy future and indeed in decarbonizing agriculture, which I think is a really important. Um, my name is Chris Hewn. I am the chairman of ADBA, of the Anaerobic Digestion of Bioresources Association, otherwise known as the Green Gas Folk. And we are uh, aiming to try and persuade people that this is a tremendously attractive solution, both for dealing with a very high profile and high powered greenhouse gas, methane, which is 28 times as powerful as CO2 uh, in the short term. And secondly, that it fits phenomenally well with the new world that we're in, uh, where we want more energy security uh, in order to protect ourselves from the sort of shocks which were delivered to world energy markets by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the rise in the gas price. So everybody in the world has the capacity by using organic wastes to generate an awful lot of their own uh, methane, biomethane, green gas, which is an exact substitute once it's been purified for fossil gas, um, but is completely renewable and uh, part of the solution, both for saving the planet and also for ensuring that we decarbonize agriculture. So I'm very pleased that we're here because this sounds like a slightly small part of what I've described, but it isn't on-farm wastes are by far and away the biggest source of feedstock for uh, anaerobic digestion in the UK. So yes, there is more to do still in wastewater. Only about 75% of wastewater treatment sewage plants are currently using AD. Yes, there is much more to do on food waste, and we ought to be mandatorily collecting it. But if you look at where the real potential is uh, over the period now to 2030 and then 2050, when we have to go net zero, then the real potential is in agricultural wastes and, and energy crops indeed grown uh, in agriculture. Uh, so this is a really important subject. It's a big subject. Don't let anybody say uh, that you shouldn't be interested in it. It's really important. So. Uh, with those uh, particular opening remarks, but I also want to mention some housekeeping points. Uh, this is organized as part of the Energy Security and Green Infrastructure Week, and that's really appropriate because there is no better form of energy security than making your own energy at home, and that is exactly what all AD does by definition. Uh, nobody finds it economic to import organic waste for treatment to the UK. Uh, so, but there is an awful lot still for us to do. Uh, to, to ensure the smooth running of this event, could you please select speaker view at the top right hand corner of the screen? That will get you the best view of all of the presentations. And please use the Q&A section to ask questions. They will be reviewed and addressed in the final section of the webinar. And in the time on a tradition, we will, of course, avoid all the difficult questions and only answer the easy ones now we're actually we have an extremely good panel that is capable and willing to tackle the most difficult questions so use uh, the q a section please please only use the chat room uh, for admin issues or general inquiries so um uh, that's the the way you use the q a section please use for questions um, and if you can make sure your microphone is on mute, that would be absolutely great. We all love your golden Labrador, but on balance, it is probably best if the barking isn't inflicted on the entire uh, uh, webinar. And this event is being recorded and will be posted on the website alongside the presentation. So you will be able to go back and... Uh, if you think you haven't understood something or you think that you missed something that somebody said, 
you will be able to go back and get it on the recording. And that's a warning to all of us as well, that we better be careful what we say because it's being recorded for posterity. Thank you very much. Um, and I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna put in a quick plug. I'm gonna put in a quick plug as well, uh, since this is a um, well attended webinar for uh, the Alba National Conference, which is coming up in just a month's time, the sixth of December in London, and is one of the two big events of the year, the biggest events of the year for uh, the anaerobic digestion green gas sector. Um, uh, and so if you are interested in continuing to follow these matters, please do attend uh, the national conference. At which point, let us um, uh, move on. Now, uh, I have a, um, uh, uh, a uh, tremendous group of speakers here. Um, we have Richard Guterbock, the director of food chains, who has forgotten more about the subject than most of us ever knew and is extremely uh, knowledgeable um, and authoritative on it. So, um, and has been around the course and seen this uh, industry from all sorts of different angles, including as a special advisor many, many years ago to uh, John Gummer when he was the, uh, the Department of um, Environment, Food and Rural Affairs. And we have Dr. David Kaner, uh, the Chief Executive of AL Clean Farming, and David has been promoting Small Farm AD for a very long time and is a very authoritative voice on the subject. And um, finally, we have our own from the home team, Wasandara Dorodinia, who is the policy analyst uh, at ADBA who follows these issues most closely. And Wasan is going to give us an, a bit of an overview uh, of how she sees uh, developments as well. Am I in the right order here? Uh, is it meant to be pre in presentations, Richard, David, Wasson, or do, was it the other way around? Um, I will be doing the first presentation. You're doing the first, first one. Yeah. Okay, fine. Sorry, I'm <laughs> you're absolutely right. In that case, uh, let us hit uh, go straight to Wasson uh, for an overview of AD in the UK, uh, the current scale, the growth potential, and making that key point about the importance of farm ad mm -hmm. uh i hope you all can see my slides uh can you see all can you see my slide can you see the slides yes absolutely looks great good. <laughs> great thank you thanks chris for the introduction um just to say that i will be doing the first presentation because mine is my presentation is talking a little bit about the role of small loan farm AD sector, but also the wider AD industry um, in essentially decarbonizing energy, while Richard and David will then dig deeper into the um, role of small on farm AD sector as a key to sustainable and profitable farming. So um, again, I'm Vasundara and I'm Adbas uh, Policy and Market Analyst for Energy and Decarbonization. Um, welcome everyone. So um, to start off, I'll let me give you a little peek into what the AD sector is um, before getting into all the deeper stuff about small scale AD. So as you can see um, from this image here, AD plants take organic wastes like food waste, livestock manure and slurries um, and uses microorganisms to break them down in the process, uh, in the presence of no oxygen. So this process produces two main products, uh, biogas and digested, which is a byproduct. Um, and here biogas itself is used to produce electricity and heat and then transport it into the grid. Or you can use them, uh, the farms and AD plants use them within the facilities. And also this biogas can be further upgraded and split into its two parts, producing biomethane and bio CO2 or biocarbon dioxide. So biomethane um, can be used for heating. It is used for heating and as a transport fuel, displacing fossil gas. And this stream of carbon neutral bio CO2 is used either in industry, industries like uh, food and beverage sector or stored. And the digested here is used as a fertilizer, a uh, biofertilizer, a low carbon alternative to chemical fertilizers. So, Essentially, these AD systems are very flexible and scalable, so they can be adapted to any size 
to manage uh, to manage available organic waste and to produce energy and heat along with other useful products uh, byproducts. Um, so moving on to the overview of the country's AD sector. The UK currently has around 723 operational AD plants, including the sewage sector. Uh, these AD plants generate nearly 20 terawatt hours of biogas a year, and they use uh, different types of feedstocks, including agricultural waste, industrial, municipal, and commercial waste, and also sewage waste to produce uh, biogas and biomethane across the UK. So these are the capacity they of 723 plants treat in million tons per year. So you can see here, the whole AD sector has grown significantly over the past two decades. This is largely uh, due, to the couple, due to a couple of support schemes like renewable obligation, renewable heat um, incentive, feed-in tariffs, among others. Um, now going a little bit towards the small scale AD sector. While there are debates in the community around the definition of what small scale is, an AD plant producing under 250 kilowatt hours are generally considered small scale. And the analysis in this presentation are based on that assumption. So in UK, there are 131 of these, um, th these AD plants that fit this criteria. It makes up about 18% um, of the UK's AD sector. Together, they produce around 19.5 megawatts of electricity and process over 1.8 million tons of waste each year. So Chris rightfully said, so it's one of the biggest um, areas that produces waste, waste feedstock for the AD sector. So of these 131 plants, 115 AD plants run solely on farm waste, like manures, lorries, and crop leftovers, crop residue. So these can be categorized, categorized as small on-farm AD, as they predominantly, if not only, use agricultural waste. So these, <clears throat> sorry, these plants collectively treat about 900,000 tons of agricultural waste a year. So moving on, this little diagram here, it shows the circularity of um, on-farm AD. Here, all the waste produced from on, uh, produced within the farm are used as feedstocks for the digester, um, and it produces energy for on-site facilities and transportation needs. And also you have biofertilizer from digested. Uh, it's, AD it's a byproduct of the AD process, sorry. And it can be used um, as an alternative for chemical fertilizers on crops, as I said before. So essentially this closes the loop in the farm. And looking at some of the benefits. Now, when it comes to farms that produce agricultural wastes, there are other options such as shipping uh, these manual slurries in sort of a hub and spoke operation. But on farm AD, it provides, this option provides several major benefits for farmers and rural communities. One, it enhances the energy security and independence by allowing farms to generate their own renewable power and heat from agricultural residues and waste generated within the farm. So rather than relying on external fossil fuel sources, the farms have an on-site sustainable energy supply. And the second one is the system also enables improved nutrient cycling through the production of nutrient-rich digested biofertilizer. By returning these nutrients to the soil, farmers can reduce their dependence on synthetic chemical fertilizers. Not only does this provide financial savings, it is also more environmentally friendly. In addition, AD systems on their farm gives farmers a waste management solution, allowing them to productively reuse the crop residues, manure, and other organic farm waste they have at hand. And these materials become a resource for energy and fertilizer rather than simply requiring disposal. And the next is this renewable energy and improved soil fertility from on-farm AD. It further supports food security by enabling increased productivity. And also um, having an on-site renewable energy supply, it allows farmers to maintain food production even when external power is disrupted, hence enhancing the energy security for food production as well. So it's really twofold. 
Finally, small on-farm AD plants strengthen rural areas by providing localized clean energy access for a lot of off-the-grid rural communities, building resilience and energy independence for these communities. So these are some, these are only some of the ways that um, how the small scale on-farm AD sector can uh, benefit the rural communities as well. So challenges. While on-farm aid is the key to this sustainable and profitable farming, and it has a lot of benefits, like I mentioned before, there are a couple of challenges for adapting this system. AD systems does incur a comparatively higher upfront capital cost, which can, in certain cases, deter small-scale farmers. However, there are new modular digesters that can be scaled to a farm's needs to avoid a mismatch between the capital expenditure needed for an AD plant. So companies like Cube Renewables, uh, they produce digesters that can be adapted to the scale a particular farm needs. Later on the webinar, we, uh, our other speakers will talk more about these kind of modules. And next we have the other challenges on planning and permitting process, which is also weaved, um, often weaved as overly complex, time consuming, and even burdensome at cases. And especially it's not optimized for small on farm systems, which can pose a challenge. Connecting the biogas energy to, uh, to the grid can also be difficult for small scale generators sometimes. And there are logistical challenges and costs to integrate into infrastructure, which is another thing that needs to be overcome. And lastly, um, government incentives currently often focus on large utility scale systems um, and it overlooks, they overlook the potential of small AD. For example, the contracts for different scheme only provide support for generators above five megawatts. So these are some of the areas um, we at BA as an organization lobby the government for and engage with them for. And essentially what we want to say is write policy support and incentives uh, with, with right policy support and incentives, this sector could thrive and provide sustainability for a lot of rural communities within the UK. And another point is, so electricity generation policies, like I mentioned before, they have been generally geared toward electricity to grid generators, and it misses the potential of on-farm AD to generate off-grid energy. So the power produced from manure and slurries within the farm via AD can provide electricity to um, a lot of facilities within the farm, like workshops, offices, houses, and also livestock facilities managements. For example, milking and grain drying among others. So we took a look at some numbers. According to Daira, a typical dairy cow uses around five kilowatt hours a day meaning the power consumption of a cow a year is around 365 kilowatt hours. So while producing, they also produce around 15 tons of manure and slurries. So our analysis shows that small AD digester, a small AD digester that uses slurry from 100 cows only would produce around 117 kilowatt hours of electricity a year, providing enough power that would equate to three times the amount of power needed to run this farm each year. And remainder can be used to support about 28 average sized rural household a year. This is just from one farm of hypothetical 100 cows. So this is just one of the ways these on-farm AD plants really come into support decarbonizing the rural community. And according to the estimates we have in the UK, there are about 90 million tons of manure and slurries and 3.6 million tons of pre-farm gate crop residues. These feedstocks alone can produce close to 10 terawatt hours of biogas, providing energy to around close to 3 million off-grid households um, and replacing about 2% of fossil gas imports. This, this system provides a multitude of benefits for farmers by diversifying the revenue, delivering low carbon energy for the farm and providing sustainable waste management systems among many other, many other benefits. In addition, on-farm AD plants are also one of the most promising mitigation measures for reducing greenhouse gas emissions, including and especially methane from manure and slurries. So while CCC Climate Change Committee has recommended that AD needs to be widely used on farms in the UK in order to um, meet the carbon goals. 
unfortunately there is still a uh, very limited to no support available for small on-farm AD plants since the feed-in tariffs and renewable heat incentive closed for applicants. Applicants. So the point I want to make here in conclusion is on-farm AD is the key to sustainable and profitable farming. And with the right support, an enlarged network of small-scale on-farm AD plants can significantly help abate methane emissions and generate off-grid power, creating an organic network of infrastructure. With that, uh, with that, it concludes my presentation. And if you, I'm happy to answer any of your questions during the Q&A sessions at the end. Um, Thank you very much, Russell, uh, for setting the scene. Uh, let's now move on to Richard, Richard Guterbock. Um, and Richard, I don't know whether you're, I think Wasson may have control yeah. of your slides. Is that right? Yes, that's I the plan. Oh, it's very dangerous. <laughs> well, yeah. You might want to speed you up or slow down. You have to keep, keep, <laughs> keep the words going in line with the slide. Um, I trust you, Sandra. Yeah. Uh, give me one second. Um, I'm going to share your slides. Okay. Okay. Here. Um. Yeah. Good. Yeah, Hello. Make it full screen. Very Hello. good. Thanks. Hello, everybody. So I'm Richard, and I hope you can see my slides and potentially hear what I'm saying. Is it yep. coming through, Chris? It is coming through. It might be better if you put the volume up a little bit. Right. I'll see if I can do that. I'll just put that closer. Is that better? That's better. Hi. So, yeah, what I want to talk about today is the the ability of AD, ignore the uh, Scottish reference on the first slide, it, 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 to highlight what AD can do in terms of delivering um, renewable energy and decarbonisation in the supply chain. So next slide, please. Uh, and what I, what I want to do is to focus on the concept of what I call on-site AD, so AD that is delivering uh, effluent and residue treatment on farm and industrial sites, and how that is transitioning businesses away from use of fossil fuels and helping decarbonize the industry. And I suspect David will rather more focus on farm AD in particular, and you will see that I will be touching on industrial food, food sector AD as, as well as farm scale AD. And I think we've, we've had a, a, an important announcement in rel re relatively recently with the biogas biomass strategy, albeit slightly underwhelming and lacking in new policy. It certainly gave a focus for the industry and the country in terms of saying, you know, this is what we need to do and these are the ambitions that we have. We, we already have a substantial AD industry, as was has, has commented on, and uh, the... Uh, map on the screen shows the the broad coverage of ad both off grid and on grid and obviously today we're focusing on plants that are not connected to the gas grid uh, and you know this is a, a sector that has largely been forgotten in the last three or four years which under the slide showed that actually ad growth has flatlined in the last four or five years largely due to uh, a, a spectacularly unsuccessful green gas support scheme, which in any case excludes off-grid plants. But, you know, biogas is vital for the future of the food industry and can help us deliver net zero ambitions, particularly in rural areas and on farms and businesses in rural areas that may not have access uh, to other forms of renewable energy. Uh, and as I was highlighting to Chris earlier, I think there's a huge opportunity. If you look at that map, there are farms and businesses in the areas that are not covered by AD plants. So on highlands and island areas in Scotland and even places like the Isle of Man, where I visited last week, potential for AD plants uh, and have a potential really to provide rural energy in the terms of power, heat and fuel uh, and help help replace fossil fuels on, on farms. Uh, but the trouble is, because of the, the lack of support from government, uh, we really need a, an urgent reboot to the industry. Next slide, please. One of the other important documents that I refer to and have used recently is the Farm of the Future report produced by the Royal Agricultural Society, which has highlighted what needs to happen if farmers to play, are to play their full role 
in uh, the decarbonization of the agri-food sector. And if you talk to food processors, retailers, they are very concerned about the scope three emissions that they have no control of, but stem back to activities on farms. So farmers have a role to play in decarbonizing the entire food chain, but also they have a role to uh, they have a role of contributing to the reduction of emissions and to the sequestering of carbon. And so the Farm of the Future report tried to set out a, a framework for the transition of, of UK agriculture towards a, a, a more sustainable solution with, with less use of fossil fuels. Uh, and this included not only uh, a main report, report and some sector journeys, but also a, a very useful report on future fuels and powertrains for the agriculture sector. And needless to say, one of the future fuels for agriculture is biomethane, and there is already a biomethane tractor being produced by New Holland. So on to the next slide, please. Uh, and as part of the Farm of the Future report, we tried to use graphics to demonstrate just how a farm will evolve with the development of robotic technology, addition of AD, uh, and other systems and solutions to actually drastically transform the way that farms are being run, in, 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 effect, in effect, delivering systems change in agriculture. And at the core of that is bioenergy, whether it's biomass or AD or, or other forms of energy generated on farms. Next slide, please. I just want to talk about one or two case studies of projects that happened under the previous feed-in tariff and RHI regime, because I think they they highlight the opportunity, but they also highlight the challenge that we face in, in developing smaller scale solutions. So uh, this is White Farms, one of the earliest of adopters of, of AD on farms, and they've since expanded their plant several times. And they are a milk processor, cheese manufacturer, and they're using a combination of cow slurry, crops, and their own uh, dairy residues way to produce biogas, which they're then using not only to run their creamery, but also to export power into the grid. And the other picture, the other site, which is a picture on the bottom uh, left of the slide, is actually a site on a creamery in Cumbria, where all the creamery waste from that creamery are going into producing biogas, which is also uh, trans transported into the grid. Next slide, please. Again, and other plants that I've been involved in in the past. Um, this is Diageo, which now has several AD plants on its distilleries in Scotland. The stills at the top use a huge amount of energy to produce each bottle of whiskey. Uh, and therefore, the, the, AD, the AD sector has got an opportunity to help companies like Diageo and other, other distillers to fully decarbonize their heat demand by putting putting biogas generated from the likes of pot ale into uh, into CHP engines to produce power and heat to run the site, and the site in the middle is doing exactly that. Next slide, please. Whizzing on quickly through these. More recently, I've been involved in a project with Brewdog. Um, Brewdog, obviously a well-known brewer in the north of Scotland, and they made a commitment to turn their entire operation into carbon a carbon negative status and the graphic shows the sort of visual of what they're trying to achieve and they recently built an ad plant on their site north of aberdeen which is producing biogas and it's actually the smallest biogas plant in the uk that is putting gas into the gas grid so we push the technology for gas grid injection to actually make it work at a, a relatively small scale of you know uh, a, a smaller plant, it's obviously going to, it has scope to expand, but it's much smaller than your typical gas grid plant. But they're not only producing biomethane going into the gas grid and then coming back into their brewery to run their brewing process, but they're also starting to run uh, trucks on the biomethane that they produce. The challenge we face is how, do, you know, Brewdog is a, was a, a, a multi-million pound project. It took three years to complete, huge amount of issues with planning and things like that. But at the end of the day, how do we how do we provide the ability to smaller brewers, smaller cheesemakers and the like to do the same as your brew dogs and your Diageos and your white farms, but to do it uh, with less investment and a more effective solution? And that's where the transition to modular AD 
comes to the fore. So next slide, please. So this really just tries to illustrate what I'm talking about, moving from a large CSDR tank to smaller tanks, and ultimately to containerized boxes that are easy to move and can be manufactured at a central location and then shipped to site. Uh, and I think it's fair to say that the, the technology available and the solutions available not only to produce the, bi the biogas, but also to upgrade it to biomethane with modular solutions like BrewDog's modular refueling unit have moved on significantly in the last four or five years. I think it's fair to say there were one or two slightly uh, less than successful examples out there of companies who tried to uh, develop modular solutions and perhaps didn't get it quite right. But I think now the technology has moved on by a significant step. And it's therefore doubly unfortunate that we don't really have the support mechanism in place to allow some really exciting British companies who are developing modular systems to actually uh, fully exploit the market potential that's out there. And, you know, biogas has an ability to reduce emissions on any size of business, whether it's a small dairy farm, a cheese factory, or, or a small distillery on an island off the west coast of Scotland. Next slide, please. I want to just use this as an example. Obviously, it's not a farm site. It's actually a brewery in Sussex. And they have made very big steps towards decarbonizing their business, firstly, investing in energy efficiency. Secondly, they have just installed a carbon capture unit from Earthly Labs. That's the Mizzel, for, uh, it's a US company, but it's now available in the UK. And that's capturing the carbon for their, from their fermentation process, allowing them, them to recycle that carbon, carbon dioxide, back into the process so that they don't have to buy expensive carbon dioxide on the market. And the next stage is they're going to be putting a a small unit like the one you can see in the middle picture onto their site. They've already got a trial unit on the site at the moment. And that site too, when it's installed, will also be able to have the, uh, be, if they go down the route of converting some of that biogas into biomethane for vehicle fuel, which is one of the intentions, that CO, then they will ca again capture CO2 and reuse it in the brewery. So you can see that modular solutions have a, an ability to engage with a much wider set of businesses, perhaps than the sort of big Diageos and, and the likes of BrewDog. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to show you some examples of the sort of type of modular solutions or small sales scale solutions that are out there, because you know it's all very well looking at plans on uh, on paper and, and visuals and concepts. So these are actually plants that have been built and operating for a number of years. Um, the, the one in the top right is on a farm, on a, on a, on a, on a, on a business site, really, on the coast of Cape, near Caith Nest in far, in far north of Scotland, next to Dune Ray. A small CSTR system producing under 250 kilowatts of electricity and being used on a business park to which it, service, which, which it services. Likewise, Cube have a number of modular systems that they have developed, some on farm, some on other sites. They've been around for a bit longer than Biofactory, the people at the bottom. Uh, Biofactory have developed a containerized system, and this is sitting on a farm in Somerset. And it was interesting, Wasundra was talking earlier about the uh, ability, or, you know, how 100 cows use a, a, a quite a significant amount of electricity, but actually can produce three times that amount of electricity if the biogas is fed into a CHP unit. So one of these units, one 140 foot container will treat the slurry from a hundred cows uh, and that can be scaled up by adding a second container uh, alongside it or even a third or the fourth. And, and I'll come back to a particular advantage of mod uh, modularity, which is a phased approach to the development of projects. But I think we also shouldn't lose sight of the fact that you know, biogas is not the only solution out there. So we also need to be looking at co-investing with biomass and biogas. So biomass plants have the ability to, apply, to, to supplement any of the energy that's available from a biogas plant. And I think in future, not only on farms, but also um, on distilleries and other places, you'll see a combination of both technologies with some, some other uh, supporting infrastructure. Next site, please. 
So again, just to reiterate, you know, I think if we're talking about the bioeconomy and the future of decarbonizing the food industry, we need to recognize that biomass is an important part of this. Again, a similar journey, a large scale plant on a creamery in Devon, a smaller scale plant on a distillery, and ultimately moving down to modular solutions that have the ability to adopt this sort of plug and play role that I, really, I think we should be advocating much more strongly. Next slide, please. So alongside the development of the technology and the development of modular solutions, I think we have an, a real opportunity to look at then how we use this energy and how we use it differently. And you know, farms are often at the end of the electricity supply cables. They're often, they ha often have, may not have access to three phase. There is a huge opportunity to actually enable farms to become a source of energy, not only for their own requirements, whether it's drying their crops or cooling their milk, farmhouses or grain stores, but also actually contributing to uh, energy generation in the local economy. And ultimately, and I think this is most importantly, ultimately providing the fuel to run the tractors and vehicles that run on farms. And I, I would say that one of the elephants in the room as far as decarbonizing farming is concerned is the fact that we still subsidize red diesel to farmers. Now, given where we are with the current energy crisis, it's probably not the time to change that. But I would, I would sort of posit the suggestion that if we haven't done something about this by 2030, uh, farmers will be, will be attacked. Farmers often get attacked, and we don't want to give them another reason. And allowing them to be attacked because they're the last industrial sector in the country to have a, a fossil fuel subsidy would not be very helpful. And I think we therefore need to come up with a, a strategic plan. Uh, I don't hope, hold out much hope of the current government doing that, but perhaps the next might be more, more forthcoming. I don't know what you think, Chris. But there, there is definitely an opportunity to look at how we can replace diesel on farms with biomethane, biomethane generated on farms or shipped to those farms. And we also have, we already have a biomethane tractor being produced in the UK. So on to the next slide. And so therefore, what, really what I wanted to try and get across before we hand over to David, who will talk, I think, in much more detail about Farm AD, is the fact that we need a vision for what I refer to as gas fuels in, in our rural economy. Um, we have a number of uh, large-scale AD plants dotted around the country. The one in the top image there is Malaby Biogas in Wiltshire, uh, a, a very good example of an extremely well run AD plant. They are looking at converting some of their, their gas into biomethane so that the trucks that you can see in that picture are then able to uh, collect and, and collect feedstock using biomethane as a fuel. And the, the biomass sector and the biogas sector have the ability to supply clean heat onto a food processing site. A lot of heat is used in manufacturing food and drink products. It has the opportunity for gas upgrade to HGV fuel. So the likes of the New Holland biomethane tractor in, in, the, in the bottom picture, built and designed in the UK, uh, supported with UK taxpayers' money, a significant step forward in the uh, the de design of, of a, a, a solution that will be enable farmers to actually replace fossil fuel. Uh, we've got the ability to do carbon capture much better than we have done in the past, and micro technology is, is becoming available, so we begin to be able to re, 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 put or sequester carbon in the soil, another role that farming can play uh, it by combining AD with other technologies. And you combine that with battery technology, there's a range of ways in which you can significantly decarbonize a business. Uh, and ultimately, we can see more solutions like uh, the one in the middle picture. This is, again, the one the plant up near Cape Ness. It qualified for the RHI, but it was one of the last plants to do so. It's going to be very hard to get real traction in AD plants of this sector if we don't have a support mechanism, it doesn't have to be an incentive. There are other ways of doing it, but it, it's it's quite a major disappointment that while I think the industry has, has welcomed the extension of the green gas support scheme, 
uh, for another three or four years to 2028, nothing has yet been said about what what is going to be done by Bayes and DEFRA to support smaller plants like this one. And we are waiting eagerly to hear what they're going to say. The opportunity is huge, as David, I think, will demonstrate. You know, many livestock farms in the country could have an AD plant, but we need an incentive regime to help it happen. So, you know, we need to address the underperforming green gas support scheme. We need to back modular solutions in a much bigger way. And we need to find ways of helping farmers to embrace the concept of actually turning their slurries into bioenergy, if possible, on site on their farm, but if not, at, at centralized plants. And I think what, what really sort of bugs me at the moment um, is that we don't really have an, a vision at governmental level for delivering the decarbonization of agriculture, particularly in terms of the generation of energy. Uh, and that's, I think, all for me for the time being. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Richard. I think that's a very good point to end on. Nobody has yet developed a very effective plan for decarbonizing the agricultural sector. And indeed, when people get a bit of the way down the track uh, in Ireland and in the Netherlands, they're even talking about just reducing livestock numbers, which seems to me to be a rather desperate uh, solution to the problem. But maybe that is one that... Uh, in the end has to be faced if if we if if there isn't a grasping of these opportunities david um over to you on the opportunities for small on farm ad um and look forward to what you have to say well thank you very much chris and uh, thank you to richard and and wasundra it's always interesting being tail end charlie on these things because you never know what the previous speakers are going to say <laughs> Are you able to see my slides? Yes. And you can hear me. That's Even good. that. Yep. Excellent. Had I been giving this presentation a month ago, it would be very different. I felt the earth move three times in the last month. The first was to do with Denmark, which was interesting. The second, which was to do with California, I considered inspiring. And the third, which was to do with Ireland, I considered to be at earthquake proportions, round about... Um, uh, seven on the Richter scale, probably. I'll come back to those a little later. Meanwhile, good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Kaner. I chair the ADBA's uh, working group on small on-farm AD, uh, and I'm also the chief executive of Advanced Anaerobics Limited. My subject today is the role of small on-farm AD in the decarbonisation of the UK's energy system. Does small on-farm AD have a role in this strategically important national priority. I must emphasize that the thoughts I set out today are my own. They don't represent the SOFAD, the Small On Farm AD Group, or for that matter, my company. But I want to start with the thought that I have a vision. I have a vision of a small scale AD plant working in the corner of every farmyard, achieving a decisive reduction in the environmental footprint of food production contributing to the decarbonisation of the UK energy system and boosting the profits of the farm. First things first, what do we mean by small scale? And Wasundra has already touched on this. Typically 250 kilowatts electric or less. That can be 750 kilowatts if it's heat in the form of biogas or up to 150 metres cubed an hour of biogas, usually processing only the feedstocks available on the farm. Um, there are other views, but that's kind of a starting point. Where is the AD industry in 2023? 723 plants, larger plants are getting larger. Um, the incentive, the, the, there's a, a big incentive for scale. Uh, this is in principle because it offers better value money for money for taxpayers. But there's a lot of feedstock, as Richard has identified, on local sites, which we can either truck this to larger plants or we can process it on site. And it's this latter that's the opportunity for small on-farm AD. So where do I see the potential? By 2020, give or take, the UK had a bit over 100 small-scale plants. We're looking forward now to the next 1,000, 
And eventually my vision would require 10,000. So let's look at each of these levels in turn. The first hundred or so were mainly on farms with some research units. They were built with the support of grants and incentives, the feed-in tariff, the renewable obligation certificates and the renewable heat incentive, all now closed to new entrants. This was a proof of concept phase in reality. The technologies were not mature. Lots of ideas were tried in the market. Of the first 100, roughly 40 or 50 are still running. Very few are being built right now in the absence of subsidies. So what constraints can we see that are holding back our growth? What have we learned so far? The first is that feedstock is key. If a plant does not have a guaranteed feedstock, it does not have a guaranteed output. Grid connections are really tough. Policy initiatives are underway to ease this, but I think grid connections are always going to be tough. Meanwhile, the value to the farmer achievable from exporting energy is too low to be attractive for small scale plants as a primary economic driver. And the specialized kits to convert biogas into electricity or to upgrade it to biomethane is eye-wateringly expensive at small scale. Management of digestate and increasing regulation around this whole area is a serious restriction Importantly, the early, the early kit required more know-how than is available on a typical farm. It was a bit like selling twin-engined aeroplanes to people without pilot's licenses. Getting off the runway, yeah, okay, we managed that, but landing again had, was prone to getting a little bit more complicated, if you'll allow me to stretch the analogy. Overall, the track record of our first 100 plants has not been one of universal success. And now, with milk prices down and interest rates up, many farmers who recognise the benefits of on-farm AD are actually not in a position to invest. So what about the next 1,000? OK, these will be sold in a very different environment. Climate change is with us perhaps 30 years earlier than models predicted, and 2023 is almost certainly going to be the hottest year on record as we test the 1.5 degree global temperature rise limit. We all have a much greater understanding of environment. Energy prices have gone up and remain volatile. Ruminant agriculture is under growing pressure as the key climate role of methane becomes clearer. Governments are looking for alternatives to livestock culls. Our technology is much more mature and serious money is beginning to sniff around anaerobic digestion as evidenced by a couple of major recent transactions. Our immediate challenge is how to get the next thousand farmers to buy. Recognizing that every farm is different that we have no single agreed model and that one size does not fit all. Let us look at five different models. Model one is our original, generate electricity for export. This was a standalone investment. In many cases, it was not integrated with the farm operations. The aim was to maximize electricity output. The key was sufficient feedstock plus an export grid connection. Economic success was reasonably certain through subsidy support but today the incentives are no longer available. Achievable prices for most projects do not give a useful return on investment. Electricity for export is really not the big winner for small on-farm AD going forward. Model two is biomethane for export, supported by the economic benefits of the renewable transport fuel obligation. This can work in specific circumstances as long as feedstock and a route to market are available. There are many variants, but the key is access to a cost-effective small-scale upgrade kit for biogas to biomethane. This is a winner in the correct circumstances as long as the farmer can retain enough of a share of the value of the renewable transport fuel certificate. Model three, is to generate energy for use on the farm only. This solution is fully integrated into the farm energy system and aims to displace energy purchases. 
no exports. The economic value of each kilowatt hour is the price the farmer buys at, always higher than the price at which he could sell export energy to the grid. Having on-farm energy, as has already been pointed out, provides energy security and price certainty in an uncertain world. Where energy demand is sufficient, the full levelized cost of on-farm generation, depending on circumstances, is of the order of 10 to 15 pence per kilowatt hour. Most farmers would be happy to sign up for all of their electricity requirements for the next 20 years at this price. This can be a very cost effective way of providing the energy to modernize a farm, expand or diversify, especially where existing grid supply is weak. It typically costs £80,000 per kilometre to put in new wires and alternative diesel generation costs anything up to 45 pence a kilowatt hour at current fuel prices. The one wrinkle is the need to balance a steady energy supply from an AD plant with the peaky demand on the farm. Uh, my company's done quite a lot of work in this area, but I'm not here to pitch for business, so I probably ought to say a little more about that this afternoon. This one really does work where energy demand is high, for example, on a typical intensive dairy farm, and it does not require an export grid connection. Model 4 looks at AD through the other end of the telescope. It exploits the environmental benefits of processing manures and slurries on the site of production, offering new approaches to methane reduction, nutrient management, control of important agricultural pathogens and the elimination of nuisance odors. It really does make a decisive difference to the environmental footprint of meat and dairy production, providing a credible alternative to livestock hulls, as long as it works economically. Model five mixes and matches elements of one through four to provide an optimum solution tailored to the specific conditions of each farm. It's an integrated waste and energy solution that is driven by the farmer's strategy for the future of his business. As such, it fits closely with the operations of the farm uh, to generate the best economic return, relying on, and I agree with you completely here, Richard, well-established modular technology elements. We don't want to be inventing new bits of technology for every single application. There's a bit of work to do up front on these projects, but it's a clear winner for many farms. Okay, we have five models to choose from. What do we need to do to make them work? Well, I think we have to plan for scale from the start, whatever the history of the industry. We need to get several well-funded companies competing with one another. We've got to refine our technologies, driving down cost and driving up ease of operation. We must avoid spills, leaks, smells and accidents. We should ensure that we have a viable supply chain to match, to support growing demand, not just here, but across Europe. We need to get a great support infrastructure in place that operators can rely on so that they know where to go when they have a problem. We should make sure that our plants are designed for safe operation on remote sites with non-expert operators. We should provide an evidence base sufficient to convince not just the farmers, but their skeptical bank managers, regulators and planners. We must focus on profit without new subsidy. Sadly, whatever we might like, the UK government of whatever colour is unlikely to be able to afford a return to FITS, ROCKS and the RHI. If we want something, it would be grant support, in my opinion, for well-monitored demonstration sites on working farms for multiple models. So where is my money? I expect to see multiple approaches, each one working in its own way. My own company, I expect to be treating manures and slurries on the site of production, delivering a decisive reduction in the environmental footprint of food production, with the kit paid for by the energy used on site to power the farm. I hope to help decarbonise agriculture. Decarbonising the UK energy system, I leave to others who are building much bigger plants. At least for now. I think that the future of AD looks bright.
The Committee for Climate Change now lists on farm AD as a key metric for the decarbonisation of agriculture. Dairy Care reports that California is on track for a climate neutral dairy industry by 2030. And California is the biggest milk producing state in the United States of America. Gas Networks Ireland in September published their document seeking to establish 176 new biomethane plants to replace 26% of Ireland's natural gas with biomethane. And what was really interesting in the document that I'd never thought of before is that 60% of the gas uh, that the Irish Gas Network carries is used to generate electricity in gas turbines. So if you want to decarbonize electricity, biomethane is part of the answer. Denmark hopes to replace 100% of its natural gas with renewable alternatives by 2035. On-farm management of farm wastes offer a viable alternative to animal culls, avoiding the end of ruminant agriculture. And to quote a Devon farmer I was speaking to, this is the future of dairy farming. And for that future, I think that building on the experience of our first 100 plants, we must push forward to get 1,000 SOFAD units, small on-farm AD units in place by 2030, accepting that not all models will work, that they won't all survive the battle for the best solution, but building on the experience of that first 100, en route to a future with a small AD plant working quietly in the corner of every farm, making money for the farmer, and making a serious contribution to the ADBA's future target for renewable energy supplies. Thank you. Happy to take any questions. Um, expecting some interesting ones. Thank, thank you very much, David, um, for a very good overview of um, what has been happening and some of the positive developments. I'm, I Just to add and underline the points that you were making about uh, Ireland and other jurisdictions which are beginning to see the real benefits of biomethane i mean I, I think one of the things which has happened over the last couple of years which has really changed uh is the fact that the government funded international energy agency has become a real uh, enthusiast for biogas and biomethane and in their latest world energy outlook they actually project on three different scenarios that there will be uh, at the minimum, the lowest scenario, 8% a year compound annual growth rate through to 2030 and 2050 and uh, up to 22% on the net zero, early net zero scenario. So uh, if we were looking at that for the UK, we'd be talking about an enormous increase to over, you know, absolutely at the minimum uh, from 700 plants to over 1800 plants by 2030 alone. Uh, so this is in other jurisdictions, particularly the EU and the US, as you pointed out, with California really motoring. Uh, and I think the government has allowed itself to slip behind um, with the green gas support scheme in seeing the benefits of the sector. Um, and I think we're going to see that change dramatically because it's such an easy potential solution. Um, and I think one of the things, if I can abuse the chairmanship by kicking off on the questions, uh, you mentioned, uh, you know, many farmers would love to be paying 10 to 15 pence a kilowatt hour. I think my last business electricity bill, I was up at a, about 30 uh, yep. pence per kilowatt hour. So uh, the question is, you know, looking at that business model where you're basically using uh, the electricity or the gas on site, and what in the the jargon is usually, I think, called parasitic load, isn't it? As part of the sort of overall input into into the into the uh, uh, businesses out, out, overall output. How big do you have to be as a dairy farm? Because we, let's get down to brass tacks here. We're talking about. The potential is, is is particularly there for dairy farms. How many cows 
do you realistically have to have in the herd to make an AD plant now wash its face in terms of either parasitic, you know, the use of the power within the farm uh, or any other business model? I'll, I'll answer that with two hats, slightly different answers. For the sort of uh, technologies that my company, AAL, offers, uh, I would think that it's going to be difficult unless you've got at least 250 cows because you haven't got enough electricity demand to cover capital costs and the financing costs with the sorts of technologies that I'm looking at. I am well aware, however, that there are other members of the ADBA SOFAD group who have business models that would work on much smaller farms than that. So um, uh, one of our members works extensively in, um, uh, in, in, in Northern Europe, in the Benelux countries, and would certainly be working down to 100 cows and maybe smaller than that. Uh, the first question is, can you collect the slurry? Because it's kind of difficult to process what you, what, what's been dropped in the fields. And mostly you find that uh, you're looking at uh, the more intensive farms, which tend to be bigger, the more, the more industrial type operations. Uh, I, I know some people dislike uh, that approach to producing dairy products, but it is where most of the milk comes from. Um, and in countries where the weather is not so benign, it's where all the milk comes from because you can't put cows out in the fields in in Egypt all year round. Uh, it, it simply doesn't work. So yeah. uh, I, I think I think um, somewhere I mean, uh, much smaller than 100 cows, I think you're going to struggle with any technology. Much smaller than 250, you're going to struggle with mine, but you have to be able to collect the manures and slurries. So UK average herd size on dairy now is what? About 80, isn't it? It's one, 170, 180, yeah. Yeah. So, so you, you, you think that really at that level, for the average herd size, they ought to be able to work up a business proposal that their bank manager is going to take seriously? Um, they've got a fighting chance. It depends on so many different characteristics. Um, the 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 one thing I would say is that when you've got a hundred and the the average herd size at one hundred and seventy, seventy five to eighty percent of the cows are in herds that are one seventy or bigger. Uh, if you just think the way that average is calculated, there's a lot of smaller farms with very few cows that. Yeah. Uh, that skew it so uh, and and certainly looking at the irish thing and the average ira dairy herd in ireland is quite a lot smaller but they are expecting to be able to if, if, yeah, if there's a, the, this great new document that's come out from uh, gas networks ireland which is their entire roadmap on how to pick up biomethane for the irish economy they've only got one biomethane plant running at the moment and they're looking to to, to make a uh, a quite extraordinary transition and they set out uh, a, a program as to how they'll do the whole thing which is uh, I, I mean i'm not proud i'll lick a good idea from anybody and uh, uh, if you put that alongside some of the other good ideas that are being floated not just at the level of individual farms or underfunded startup businesses but at the level of countries and uh, uh, and, and regions there, there's actually a story to tell here that I think we ought to be taking to ministers existing and new. Yeah, I, I think just to reinforce what you say, when I was at the Northern Ireland conference for ADBA recently, it was very, very clear that there's fantastic potential on on on, on the on farm sector there, as there is indeed south of the border, as you've highlighted. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, where you've got very high livestock concentrations, and and uh, you know, I think AD is going to be a essential part of the conversation the one thing that does slightly i mean if you look at the california example that you gave the average herd size for dairy in the u.s is now 2000 and the and the plants are monumental uh, yeah, in california absolutely. there's, there's one there's one capturing everything in 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 shed yeah. so, and so then, the then there's, there's, a, there's yeah. a plant in wisconsin which is taking the slurry from thirty thousand cows yeah. And they're processing that for energy and they're recovering all the nutrients and they're processing all the wastewater. And it's a really interesting plant. I'm not entirely sure that that sort of scale of farming would 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 suit uh, UK sentiment. But uh, well, well I only know of one. I know of, uh, I, I know of one dairy farm of that sort of nothing like that size, but even over over um, 
personally, I only know of one dairy farm even over that US average in the UK. There must be a few more, but they're not. But, they're probably not. Uh, there are there big. are a, a a handful of farms over a thousand cows, and one or two of them have AD plants and their conventional CSDR yeah. plants that work reasonably well. But if I could just chip in, Chris, I think this point about a hundred cows is important. That you know being able to develop a plant that deals in modules of 100 cows, um, it, it enables a phased approach. So while we probably, and I think David's right, we're probably going to be starting with the larger farms that maybe have three, four, 400 cows as the, as the starting point for trying to get this vision, which David and I share, I think, you're going to have to start with making it easy for the farm to, to adopt the technology. And I think modular answers that because instead of building the plant and spending say two or three million building a, a 500 kilowatt ad plant if you can put on a module that does the first hundred cows get it to work demonstrate satisfactorily that you have a solution that you can afford then you can add further modules and this doesn't only apply on farms this also applies on factory sites like breweries and things like that and i think while you know, while I wouldn't endorse every modular technology that's out there, there are a few skeletons in the cupboard. I would say that a, a well-proven modular plant, get one on the site, get it working, and then if it works, you can then look at expanding it and putting two or three more on. Yeah, uh, and I think that you know that should be something that we should try and embrace as part of this strategy. Because I entirely agree, we should be looking at a thousand farms with ad plants on the corner of their their farmyard by the by well, the I'm end also, of 2030 I, I mean frankly i'm also sort of astonished that there aren't more farmers looking at this as a way of changing their marketing proposition because you know this is a sector that whose lunch is currently getting eaten by people like <laughs> oakley you know who yeah. are making uh, milk substitutes which are claiming to be much better for you because they're low carbon and so on uh and actually ad would allow a lot of dairy farms to claim if they were using the uh, renewal transport fuel certificate and they were actually feeding their uh tractors and their uh, and their um uh haulage with biomethane um well, uh, well, chris don't don't underestimate the impact of current economic conditions on farmers uh, I mean, if you take a, a, a farm with 600 dairy cows, each producing 10,000 litres of milk per year, which is a big farm, but not mm. unusually big, and you knock 20 pence off the milk price, which is what's happened since Christmas, you've just taken about 1.2 million off the top line of that company. You then assume he's got a certain level of borrowings. And if you take the average level of borrowings and, 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 and gear that up by an additional 5% on the interest rates, that's another quarter of a million gone. Yeah. And then they're also looking at uh, a fairly rapid reduction in the farm support payments under the old common agricultural policy and a lot of policy uncertainty around that area. They could be looking at one and a half million pounds off the bottom line uh, from a business that was previously producing a profit of 200,000 a year. And yeah. they are looking at cash flow. They're looking at affordability on these things. And that's the it's a very it's a cyclical industry, but it's a cyclical industry that's got itself caught between a rock and a hard place with being both cyclical and being hit by policy uh, yeah. uncertainty. It's the uncertainty that's so crippling. So when you talk, if you if you get the farmer sold, you then go and sit in front of the bank manager who says, OK, you want anything from quarter of a million to two million, depending on what the project is. Um, how are you going to pay for it? Yeah. The, the, I think the key point, though, isn't it, is is that if your basic market is, is a commodity market, you're totally a price taker, which obviously most milk, vast majority of milk producers are, hmm. um, and you're getting attacked by products like Oakley, which are uh, branded, uh, able to extract a premium because they're making claims. Um, maybe there is a market for milk that is actually marketed as zero or low carbon milk uh, produced on circular economy farms. Uh, well, they, they, that, that is, that, that's yeah. absolutely true. And uh, there is a key uh, group of organizations here, which is the milk processors and the retailers. And the milk processors and retailers all, to a man, are very, very aware of the environmental importance of, of what they're doing. 
um, the, the the different levels. So they're, they're trying hard to decarbonize their own operations, but they are looking very carefully at technologies. We know that government is looking for best available technologies in the whole space, particularly of manure and slurry management and nutrient neutrality. We know that uh, they would be really interested if we could demonstrate that anaerobic digestion does what we say on the circular farming thing. But we that there's a lot of claims, but very little consistent evidence, if, if you'll allow me to be slightly unkind to our industry for a minute. And, and that, that's why I was making the, the suggestion that if we could extract just one thing from government ministers, some uh, grant support for some properly moderated uh, trials uh, on, on farms, on real farms with different technologies would be a huge leap forward just to give us that evidence base. Yeah. The, the other thing I think that Richard quite rightly mentioned was the is, is the red diesel subsidy, which you know, is looking more and more indefensible in a world where we're trying to decarbonize. But surely some government must be able to come up with a way of phasing out red diesel while phasing in uh, <laughs> subsidies to producing biomethane as an alternative, for example. Yeah, I, I have to say, as a businessman, I've got rather tired of waiting for government initiatives. Yeah. I, yeah. Many years ago, when I first came into AD, I actually met with a minister, with a minister, and and on the way in, the official who was showing me in, you'll know the protocols here, said, "What you've come up with is exactly what the ministers look for." And I got this sinking feeling because a, it assumed that ministers know what they're looking for, and b, it assumed that that requirement would stay stable for more than a yeah. few weeks. And neither, neither assumption turned out to be correct. And, and I'm sure you know far more about that than I do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's largely an issue of lack of vision at the right level within government, I think, Chris. And, you know, you and I have talked about this before. But, you know, OK, we may not be able to get a feed-in tariff or an RHI back. You know, it's almost certain that won't be the case. But the amount of time that officials in DEFRA and DESNES are taking to sort of think through and, the, you know, ADBRA has provided them information on off, on small scale and off-grid AD. It's not as though we haven't been putting those messages through the post boxes of DEFRA and Bayes. It's just that they seem wedded to sticking to a, a regime that doesn't work. The, the, the Green Gas Support Scheme hasn't delivered the, the growth that was expected. Uh, and I think, you know, it's going to be hard to get farmers to take up the the challenge of making ad work in their business if we don't have uh, at least a government that's willing to sort of endorse the idea of farm decarbonization and it's yeah. actually noticeable I, in, in scotland i do quite a lot of work in scotland business in scotland particularly distilleries but other people are much more willing to embrace looking at renewable energy as part of their business plan because yeah whatever you might say about the Scottish government, you know, every party in Scotland speaks largely from the same hymn sheet. We saw that at the uh, Scottish conference that you and I were at a few weeks ago. Uh, and I think it does come back down to the subliminal messaging from within government that they want farmers to engage in decarbonisation. And I think, you know, it's been a source of frustration to me that DEFRA hasn't really picked up the ideas that we've given them from the Farm of the Future report, and it's not just on AD, it's on a whole range of things, whether it's robotics or or whatever, but particularly on Farm AD. I mean, I, I completely buy into what David's saying, but while we might not want a return to subsidies, we've got to look at demonstration. I think David's spot on with the idea of demonstration yeah. sites on farms, not only for AD, for a whole range of other technologies. And I think yeah. the synergies... But in, but in, in, in reality, Richard, I mean, we're not just talking about a subsidy. Um, uh, I mean, uh, you know, one of the things which I think is most exciting, and I think Wasson mentioned it in her presentation, is the fact that the government is now seriously looking at the extension of the emissions trading scheme uh, to uh ad now that's going to be particularly important in the food waste sector because incinerators are going to have to start paying the real cost of uh, the emissions that they're making but it's also potentially a game changer for on farm uh ad as well if the emissions trading scheme is 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 actually provides clear benefit monetized benefit 
for the operator uh, from the carbon savings or greenhouse gas savings equivalent that they're uh, making. And that, that would be very good news. And if you combine that, for example, with a phase out of red diesel, you could begin to see things would really change in terms of the incentives in the farm sector. And perhaps people should be be thinking about that because that world has yeah. got to be coming at some point. I mean, it's just yeah. a question of when, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think we've got to we've got to see leadership both from the AD industry in terms of the OEMs coming up with technologies that work and are reliable and trustworthy, but also from the farming industry saying, look, we want to see these technologies on our farms. And, you know, I think the NFU is, is always saying, you know, saying the right thing. But I think it's actually we've got to find a way of making it easier for farmers to embrace a technology they're not familiar with. Uh, and that does mean demonstration sites. So farmers can go and kick the tires as it were yeah um i mean i you know in an ideal world i would have thought it would be uh that we should be looking for some of the tr really trusted names in agricultural equipment manufacturing to be getting into producing modular uh, modular reactors and selling it on whether it was sort of john deere or you know whoever uh, and if New Holland had done the biomethane tractor, maybe they could be producing something that, um, uh, again, uh, you know, farmers were familiar with because the brand is familiar and they had confidence that it would be provided with the sort of support necessary to make sure it, it went on working. I, I think uh, New Holland have been surprised by the struggle they've had in uh, they've sold more tractors outside the UK than they've sold in the UK. Um, but they have actually invested in a biomethane company. They've invested in a company called Benjamin, who are doing yes. um, really the capturing fugitive emissions from Lagoon. So one of the, the, the range of technologies available. But I think they, as if they want to take, they want the industry to take their technology seriously, they need to help with this idea of demonstration farms. And it's, you know, something that I have actually discussed with them that, you know, they need to be more proactive in working with farmers that have AD plants and actually helping more farmers to bring AD plants onto the site to provide fuel. And going forward, you know, the, there's quite a lot of opposition to more power generation from biogas because of the NOx and things like that. But uh, I think, think uh, for David's model four and model five, you know, a, a mix of heat and fuel, heat being used on farm and maybe sold uh, within the local village or, or whatever, plus fuel for the farm and for local fuel users, present should present quite an attractive proposition because don't forget we've got the RTFO for the fuel sales. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and you know that if you're a dairy farmer uh, having to ship milk to a cheese plant, you know you could actually be looking at decarbonising the whole transport uh, yeah. fleet as well. Um, and, the, and, and there are something... some cheap modular. You know, there are people developing cheaper, modular, small-scale, um, small-scale gas upgrade systems. Yeah, but it would be really interesting to know whether any, bit, you know, some of the big dairy producers would actually be able to get a premium for their milk if they were able to show that it had been decarbonized in the process by using. What, 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 using what you're all, what you are seeing is that uh, one or two of the big milk processors have a point scheme now that does pay a premium price um, for ticking the boxes. Um, they've shied away uh, from going with on-farm micro AD so far yeah. for one very simple reason. And it's the point that, uh, that it's a delicate point for the industry, which is that during the proof of concept phase, that initial hundred plants, we didn't have hundred percent success rate. Uh, I mean, my, my mind always goes back to those wonderful pictures from, from the second world war of the early experiments with the V2 rockets with one after another of them going three feet up, off the ground and then falling over. Uh, it didn't stop the Saturn V eventually taking man to the moon um, and it was effectively the, the derivation of the same technology. But any technology that comes along uh, takes time to mature uh, mm -hmm. and ours is no different. And I think we're now sitting with a much more mature technology. We simply need to sing that song rather more strongly, rather because a lot of farmers know farmers who had a bad experience with the first generation. 
and um, yeah, the well, farming some network. Of the farm... grow, grow, some of those tales have grown in the telling as well, of course. Uh, right? Absolutely, yeah. and the farmers are hugely well networked. Uh, at the end of the day, I mean, I'd be very unkind to farmers here, but I think farmers would invest for one of three reasons. Versus that they're forced to, either by their milk processor or by regulation. The second is that they think they're going to make a whole load of money out of it. In other words, it's going to boost the profit of the business. Mm. And if I'm slightly unkind for a second, uh, it's because they feel they might be missing out on something. At the moment, sure. none of those three are, are a no-brainer for them. Okay. And, and so there's a commercial issue here as well as technical and, and governmental regulatory issues. Let me let me put a sort of um, a devil's advocate point to you both, uh, and maybe Wasson as well might want to comment on this. It, you know, what we're seeing overall is uh, modular uh, plants may be a real solution, but they're relatively early stage. But what we do have is a very good example of hub and spoke collection into big AD plants. And that is the nature energy model in Denmark. And as you know, nature energy has just been bought uh, by Shell um, in a major billion, you know, multi-billion dollar transaction. BP has bought Arcare, the biggest biogas operator in the US. Total Energy is, is investing an awful lot of money into AD in some of the most attractive sites on the continent, like Poland, for example. Um, maybe the future of decarbonizing farming is not to assume that the farmer has to operate the AD plant, but to get it up to a big scale where we know there are returns to scale with AD, uh, and all of those headaches that you rightly pointed out, David, about some of the early small scale plants have been taken off the farmer's hand because the professionals like Nature Energy in Denmark are basically running the big scale plants. And then the feedstock is being shipped in and then the farmer is having to deal with it just as a way of, you know, they get a check. They get a check for shipping the stuff, the feedstock to the AD plant. Is that likely to be a more successful model, maybe, than small scale on farm AD? I, 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 I've looked at this many times, and let's let's forget about our own commercial interests and take a helicopter view. If you've got lots of point sources of manures and slurries, and a technology that has a big scale economy attached to it. You can defy that scale economy and try and scale down to small modular plants and process on the farms. Or you can, uh, and, and that comes, the, the simplest version of that is where you only generate the energy you need on the farm. Or you can work at the level of the farm for the processing and you can collect the, the energy, whether it's as biogas or electricity or biomethane. Or you can move the slurries and manures to central processing units. And all three of those have merits and demerits. Um, if, if I'm very par partisan for a second, there are two issues, particularly with um, moving the manures and slurries to central processing. The first is blocking all the rural roads with uh, large numbers of vehicle movements. And the second is technically solvable, but it's a risk of cross-contamination if you bring the digestate back to the farms. Um, the Irish approach would be not to bring back uh, digestate in a form uh, other than as a fully processed fertilizer. And the, the, the model, the hub and spoke model that actually in includes nutrient recovery is hugely powerful because we're focusing here on greenhouse gas emissions on energy. But the whole question of nutrient management, nitrate and phosphate in our water courses, et cetera, is, is, is hugely important as well. And, and we've highlighted it as a positive because we can make better use of the nitrogen and phosphorus elements in the slurry. But there's the negative side of stopping the contamination of the River Wye and, uh, and, and the River Rhine system in the Netherlands. I mean, the, the reason that the Dutch culled their dairy herb was nothing to do with greenhouse gases. It was nitrate. And, and so, you know, we have to be aware that there are other 
environmental elements. Well, that's a really big issue in Ireland as well, and a really well, big issue in Northern Ireland. I absolutely, mean, at... and I, I've been pushing at the Irish the uh, the idea that what they should do is process the manures and slurries on site, retain as much of the nitrogen and yeah. phosphorus as they need on site, and only truck the bits they don't want on the farms yeah. to a central processing unit. Um, I'm afraid I came to the debate too late. <laughs> I, okay. I think just to chip in there, I think the hub and spoke system does work in in some circumstances, as David had suggested. It, it would work better where that central point was connected to the gas grid, and you know having a a spoke delivery into a hub plugged into the gas grid so it would qualify for the green gas support scheme. But I think you have to be realistic, and and I think it was a surprise to New Holland. You know, many, many farms are far away from the gas grid. So where where mm -hmm. the gas grid doesn't come into play, we have to have an alternative regime, whether it's grant based or, or whatever, that actually, you know, to get us to those thousand that David talks mm -hmm. about, we need to do something. We need a carrot and there needs to be some sort of carrot to get the next two or three hundred AD plants over the next two or three years uh, using existing and available technologies. And there are probably four or five companies out there that, that the British companies could do that at scale. But we need uh, and we need one or two other things. We need changes in the planning system to make it easier for these things to happen. The Environment Agency needs to, and I understand why, because of some of the, 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 the mistakes that have happened. The Environment Agency is not a great fan of AD, but I think the Environment Agency needs to buy in to the concept of farm decarbonization and work with farmers to come up with ways of doing it. It might include training programs and things to ensure that AD plants are run properly. But you know, at the moment, they're drilling down into these narrow sort of selective rule systems that you know, they're developing one now for, for farm lagoons and ignoring modular. They haven't even woken up to modular. So I think mm. it's the it's the the infrastructure around the industry so it's the leadership from government it's the regulatory system and it's also you know if we're going to do, get the thousand half farm target we need to do something to stimulate it for the first 200 or so mm. there is a mm. problem though that we that, that that is the elephant in the room and it's the problem of scale and i know i mean chris we've discussed this many times over the years and and you were the first to raise it with me it would take 40,000 50 kilowatt anaerobic digesters to displace one two gigawatt nuclear power station. Mm. A 300 cow dairy farm can produce enough biomethane to power two HGVs. The last time I looked, there were 500,000 HGVs registered in the UK, and that doesn't include the ones that come across from Europe that are not UK registered. Yeah. So we have to be realistic when we're talking about the impact on energy policy and energy structures of small on-farm AD. We will not move the needle on small on farm A with small on farm AD until we have built tens of thousands, but we can make an enormous difference of the at the level of an individual farm. Yeah. Just in case, by the way, David, anybody thinks that you know when you start talking about ten thousand AD plants in the UK compared with our current seven hundred and twenty-three that you, you're smoking something, I should point out that Germany actually currently has more than 9,000 AD plants. So, you know, and, and it, China, as it came out of the uh, Cultural Revolution, allegedly had 40 million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, don't, I don't know if anybody was counting them, to be honest. But, uh, okay. that, that would be, look, um, we've got a couple of questions coming up on the Q&A. Uh, perhaps I could, I think this is particularly aimed at uh, Richard for his presentation about brew dog. I was very impressed by the you know, the fact that all Richard's examples seem to be making alcohol. I hope your liver's okay, Richard. <laughs> alcohol, and alcohol and cheese. <laughs> alcohol and cheese. Alcohol and cheese. Brewdog, what's the gas production at Brewdog plant? That was one question. And have Brewdog managed to produce food grade CO2? Now that's an interesting question. So on the size on the size of the plant. I, those of you who saw the image, it's actually designed to add a, sec a second uh, a digestion tank in a couple of years' time. It's the moment it's 400 cubic metres an hour of biogas. And when you think that most of the gas-to-grid plants that have been built over the last five or six years are probably over 1,000 cubic metres, you can see that we had to push the technology. And, you know, uh, a third of the cost of the plant was the upgrade and the transmission to the gas grid. So uh, it's, it's, it's at the smaller end. And I would say that 
pretty much anything below that level, you're never really going under the current technology to justify gas grid injection. And this is where off-grid upgrade into vehicle fuel and uh, providing fuel for, for local heating, I think, becomes an option with some of the modular, smaller scale upgrade systems that are being developed that you know are going to come in at a more reasonable price. And in terms of BrewDog managing to produce food grade CO2, not yet. Uh, that's part of phase two of their project. Um, they are looking both at capturing CO2 from the brew houses, as Hepworth are doing, uh, but also putting in a uh, an upgrade system on the AD plant, which will be designed to produce food grade food up, food grade CO2. And if you think of the peaks that we, troughs we've had in the or the Malaji peaks in the CO2 price over the last five years, I think you know if we can start replacing fossil CO2 with biogenic CO2. Uh, you know, and there are plants doing that in the UK. The, the Poundbury plant down in Dorset is a good example. Um, you know, it, it can be done. It's quite expensive to to, dem to, to achieve food grade standard, uh, but it's definitely possible. And, and more sites, I think, will be doing it in the next four or five years. Yes, so CO2 I, I... is crucially important because I think that the UK has now just closed down its two major remaining uh, ammonium nitrate mm -hmm. fertilizer plants. Yeah. yeah. And that's well, where think, all, that's where suspended. all the chemical CO2 comes from. And now those plants have gone. I have no idea where the UK gets bulk CO2 from. It'll have to import it. It's It'll imported important. for Scandinavia for, by yeah. BrewDog at the moment. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, I think a lot of those things where, uh, you know, the, the fossil gas price has pushed people out of business. Uh, uh, you're going to see a lot of imports coming in as, from as far away as the U.S., yeah. Simply because the fossil gas price is so much lower there than it is in the UK. Yeah, so I well, think the more, the more successful we are at displacing inorganic fertilizer, the better the market for biogenic CO2 is going to yeah. become. Yeah. <laughs> well, the, 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 the technology is that the technology is there to do it at small scale. So the the Earthly Labs it's a solution that's on uh, the the Hepworth site could be adapted for for AD plants. But I think you know the, the we, again we need to see grant funding going into the development of co2 capture you know across the ad industry well worse than that would also be something that would potentially be incentivized by covering the sector with emissions trading scheme because obviously a plant yeah. that was using capturing uh co2 would benefit even more wouldn't it mm. yeah 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 i agree i mean with the eds also that's one of the things that they are considering uh, when it comes to taking um, taking on AD and AD with CCS, carbon capture and storage and usage under the scope of ETS. And even apart from that, it's one of the areas that the government is currently very interested about, which is good news for AD sector as a whole, because that's capturing the carbon, while the carbon dioxide, and I'm also answering one of the questions in the Q&A um, section, like capturing the carbon dioxide is how AD can become carbon negative, but even without capturing them, the carbon released to the atmosphere is not um, adding greenhouse gas to the atmosphere. It's carbon neutral because uh, that's already, that carbon is already in the carbon cycle through feedstocks. So, but like you said, um, the revenue comes through that and it makes the sector carbon negative. So that's where the future future is when it comes to CCS. Yeah. Well, obviously, if you take biogenic CO2 and you then store it, that even goes carbon negative. And so that has yes. potential for, for getting even more out of the emissions trading. Yeah. And, but I, I was told, um, which I found very surprising, that actually we th always think about food grade CO2 as being uh, particularly pure and refined. But if apparently the CO2 for storage in these sites in the North Sea has to be even purer than food grade. Interesting. Uh, and I'm not quite sure why, whether that was about um, uh, about potential met metallurgical problems in pipelines or whatever, I don't know, but I think there was something there. Um, okay, uh, have we been through, um, uh, Wasson, do, do you want to have a quick look through and see whether there are any other questions that we need to address before we begin to wind um, up what I think has a very been a very interesting session? Yeah, suppose we did 
um, address all of the questions. Some uh, not if not directly through the discussion, okay. but maybe we can give some last comments about uh, one of the questions that's on the hydrogen. Um, uh, what's our what's the panel's opinion on upgrading biomethane from AD into hydrogen and CO two, and move beyond C carbon neutral biofuels? Um, mm -hmm. in 2030 and to net zero fuels in 2050. Maybe we can give uh, some closing remarks from panelists on that. Yeah. Who who would, would either of you like to have a go, uh, Richard or David, on the issue of hydrogen? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll pop in here if I can. Uh, for those who aren't aware, I used to be a chemist if you go back a few decades. And um... not the high street sort. <laughs> Not the high street sort. I actually started as ICI's worldwide expert on steam reforming catalysts. So okay. I was working at ICI. You already taking, lost me, David. Taking 25% of the country's natural gas to make inorganic fertilizers. So, uh, uh, and and, and this, this, this whole space fascinates me because methane and hydrogen plus uh, CO2 is essentially interconvertible relatively easy process to move either way from methane to to, to 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 hydrogen or from hydrogen to methane what are the uh, energy losses though oh well that that the it, it that um going from methane to hydrogen takes quite a lot of energy that's what we were doing when we were mm. making fertilizer um by 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 uh just just by a reflection by a mirror image going from the going in the other direction should release energy in principle so going from uh, hydrogen to methane would release energy you could quite effectively absorb co2 uh, into into biomethane if you really wanted mm -hmm. to do that um but i think the whole interplay between the methane economy and the hydrogen economy going forward is going to be really really important and whether methane's role whether biomethane's role is as an interim uh until we get uh, large amounts of green hydrogen which is kind of the the normal assumption at the moment or whether things will go in a different way uh, i think is a, a really interesting discussion uh, I, I get involved in a lot of discussions about whether hydrogen or methane is better, uh, bi or biomethane is a better way of, um, uh, of, of of replacing uh, fossil fuel gas in the in the gas network. But just since you since you're a chemist, let me ask you because the key thing it seems to me looking at the industrial sector in particular is where you yeah. have really high temperature heat requirements. Yeah, uh, are there actually high temperature heat requirements that can't be dealt with by biomethane and could only be dealt with by hydrogen? I wouldn't have thought so. The problem with biomethane is whether you've got enough feedstock to make enough biomethane to go to all yeah. of the applications you could use for it. Uh, I mean, biometh should biomethane be used for decarbonizing heat, in other words, replacing natural gas? Should it be used to uh, decarbonize transport? Uh, should it be converted into something else? Uh, should it be used to decarbonize difficult to decarbonize industries uh, and different countries have different approaches here so the germans for example are focusing their hydrogen economy not on you know, vehicles and and gas and, and and heat but on the production of steel and the production of fertilizer which is quite interesting which i think uh, actually might you know I, I, the where hydrogen it seems to me is bound to win is where there really is no other reasonably economic possibility but you know the you look at the energy costs of creating hydrogen yeah uh, even if it in theory you uh, regard the energy costs as extremely low in periods when there isn't much demand for electricity coming out of wind turbines or coming out of solar the reality is that the the, the energy costs of creating hydrogen are, are pretty high and uh, one of the bizarre things that I've noticed over the last 10 years is that, you know, the people who used to be think that hydrogen was the way forward for absolutely everything <laughs> have gradually been losing the battle uh, yeah. in sector after sector. So, you know, I mean, BMW and Mercedes and various other big companies were investing in hydrogen cars. I mean, well, when, I, when I was when I was researching in the laboratory, the professor would allow us to do absolutely anything we wanted to, except use hydrogen. 
The reason was it's quite hydrogen molecules are extremely small and they have a nasty habit of escaping. And in combination with oxygen, that all gets very exciting very quick. Yes. Yes. Having said that, it is where I mean, people who get very concerned about hydrogen in the gas network as a safety issue should bear in mind that for, de for, for many years we used town gas. Town yeah. gas was 50 percent hydrogen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. But so I mean, putting 50% hydrogen. The, the back government, back. Even, even, even the British government now, although you know, heat pump installation in the UK is lagging way behind what it is in other countries yeah. in Europe. Uh even the UK government has now said that the way forward for domestic heating is not gas, it is it is electric heat pumps simply because of the potential efficiency of, of of its use. So, you know, hydrogen has lost the per passenger vehicle market. It's l very clearly losing the domestic residential heat market. Uh, I think it's going to have a key role in some of these high uh, heat applications in industry. But, you know, maybe biomethane can do that better than uh, than hydrogen um, and what the best and most if, economic use of biomethane is, you know, we will we will see in the transition to net zero. I, um, but coming just coming briefly back to the the original question, what about converting hydrogen into methane and methane into hydrogen? Most of the hydrogen historically produced in the world has not been produced electric uh, by electrolysis. Yeah. It's produced by the steam reforming of methane, natural gas. Yep. Uh, so the production of, of hydrogen is Don't very energy intensive hydrogen. and hugely, hugely carbon intensive. Yep. Uh, and, and so it should be avoided at all costs. Um, blue hydrogen is, is, is that same process where you capture the carbon, the carbon in the form of carbon dioxide and put it back under the, under yep. the North Sea. And if that worked, in theory, it's a, it's a good process. But uh, uh, there will be practical issues with that. Just just to chip in, I, I did actually well, look, just... look at... I'm sorry. Apologies. We're, we've only got three minutes left. Just okay, we better we better wrap up. Richard, one final word. One final word from all the panelists, and then we're going to wrap up. And Jocelyn's going to bring the uh, screen down. I think the focus needs to be on what we can do to make the transition to biogas on farms easier for farmers to embrace, to address some of the issues of the past, and actually bring forward demonstration sites and the like. I think you know we can leave the likes of hydrogen to other people in the future. We, we, we've got a perfectly good fuel in biomethane. We've got far too many uses for it and not enough of it. So let's focus on using it both. Very into much the agree with that. David, the last word. This is the best idea that I've seen in 50 years in business. The time is now. Let's just make this actually happen. And let's get that ambition out there and not worry too much about the fact that we've had some problems with government policy over the last 10 years. Thank you very much, Wasson. Yeah, just to add um, to all of that, and there's not much to um, say from my side, but policy support and um, financial support is very important also when we come to growing the sector further and small small scale AD and also the wider sector. With that, I just want to mention, if you uh, had any questions that were unanswered, please reach out to uh, one of us. You might be able to find the contact information and then you might be able to help you out on those questions. Thank you very much. We're always there. And uh, the email address is easily found online or on the ADBA website. Don't forget about the national conference coming up on the 6th of December in London. Uh, it's the absolutely key to attend event along with uh, the summit in the summer uh, for the sector, which gives you an opportunity to uh, find out all the latest things that are going on uh, and the real opportunities there are in the sector. Uh, this is, as the International Energy Agency has said, globally going to be a sector in renewables growing faster than wind. Just remember that. This is a really big sector that is going mainstream and becoming a sector with enormous potential economic opportunities. And Farm AD, on Farm AD, is a key part of that because that's where the feedstocks are. So thank you very much to everybody. Um, I think a very interesting discussion and uh, please keep in touch. Thank you, Chris. Bye. Thank, Thank you, you Chris. Bye. Thank you, Sundra. Bye. Bye. Thank you very much.